Howdy folks, so this is a conversation with my pal Stephen Potter on eugenics and this was something I was unfamiliar with and most people are completely unaware of eugenics because it's not spoken about and it's quite a dark part of our history in America and it's affected a lot of other parts of our life and the life of other countries and is all of society and it's quite intense can be quite heavy so just sit back and relax and let it let it wash over you enjoy this is a, a very special occasion for me in that i have been studying the world of eugenics since 2009 and how uh it impacts literally almost everything that we are involved in now uh, that we're not even aware of. So, the yeah. Eugenics well, before movement, you start, can you? Your collar's a little. You don't like the pop collar. Fresh. Uh, if it's a, a full flat. pop, I'll go with the full pop. But it's half yeah, pop. It would do it that way. You want to do? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. Yeah. So yeah, okay, tell good. us what eugenics is. How I'm going to set it up and how I'm going to speak about it is going to be completely oversimplified. To boil it down, you know how throughout history we have uh, bred different dogs to have different attributes and different cows and stuff like that? They started doing that with people. So they realized in the 1870s, 1860s, into the 1890s, during that spread of time, that if you bred tall people with tall people, you get tall people. But how that started was Francis Mendel was a priest and he did thousands of experiments with different kinds of plants. Uh, and, and ironically, the, it was green and yellow peas. So if you bred green peas with green peas, you get green peas. And if you bred yellow peas with yellow peas, you get yellow peas. But if you did green and yellow, then it would be a, a question mark. So they couldn't, and you got to remember, this was before science actually really existed. So it was all very theoretical at the time. And so what they had was observation more than anything else. Didn't understand why it worked. They didn't understand genetics yet. They just knew that if you did certain things and tinkered with certain things, then you would, come, you would have a predictable outcome. So many people that we would recognize their names, Booker T. Washington, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, people like that were writing for what was called the Journal of Heredity, and it was specific to uh, predominantly food. So what they were dealing with was drought, famine, bugs at a whole other level, and so there was a massive starvation in different areas of the country. And so they were trying to figure out how do we put wheat together and grain together in such a way that you can grow it whether it's in drought or not, or you can grow it whether or not there's bad wind. And so they were tinkering around with different strains, and it started with food, and then it went to animals, and then it went to people. So in the laws of nature, so to speak, it would stand to reason that if you have certain kinds of cow that have less fat than other types and you breed those cows together, then you're going to get a predictable product. So then they started looking at with people. So you've got the same kind of observation, common denominators. So the rationale at the time, and keep in mind, I'm not saying I agree with any of this. This is just the rationale at the time was if you have two or more generations of, of criminals, then logically their children are likely going to be criminals. If you had two or more generations of people that had a lower IQ, or that were extremely poor or destitute or been in mental hospitals or were known as sexual deviants or any number of different things, then it would stand to reason that that's going to continue. So they were looking at the, the social ails of the world and keep in mind, it didn't actually have anything to do with race per se yet because what they were looking at was criminality, feeble mindedness and pauperism. So those were the eugenical top three undesirable traits. So pauperism means poor, means poor. Gotcha. The argument you hear in, in, the, in the different government factions is, is, you know, we've got all these people on welfare and it's draining 
all of our money. And then it's like, well, we've got all this money in military and it's draining all of our money. And we've got all this money in education and it's draining all of our money. Those conversations started in the 1860s. Yeah. So when they were looking at what is this, what is the society that we want? They wanted to get rid of criminals. They wanted to get rid of people that were considered to be lower IQ'd and they wanted to get rid of poor, which is interesting because you're always going to have poor. It's just, it's all relative. Mm. So if you got rid of everybody that made minimum wage right now and everybody made more money, then the new money would be now the poor money. So none of that was actually even possible. But the way that they were understanding it at the time was if all of society was raised to a particular level, then these other undesirable outcomes would, would disappear themselves was the rationale. So the danger of that, though, was, okay, but then how do you get rid of those people? Because you have to end the bloodline to have it go away. So anybody that fell under those categories were now undesirables. So they went from being people to being undesirables. It was an actual category. So if you look at it now towards the attitude of the homeless or people with PTSD that, uh, you know, there's just, if you think about all the stereotypes, one of the common adjectives still is undesirable. And it was a very specific category. So keep in mind, this is all in the United States. And although it would bleed over into Europe, it actually started here. So in the late 1890s, they were trying to get through Congress to f pass a law to force sterilize people that fell into these different categories, starting with criminals. So mm -hmm. they wanted to basically go into all of the prisons, not jails, but the prisons um, for offenders, et cetera, and have them all sterilized. So that would take care of that. And then that didn't, that was seen as inhumane and unethical, uh, especially if you think about it, the way that they had access medically to sterilizing people at the time was equal to cutting the balls off of deer, uh, steers. So they didn't have any better medical training other than you take the parts out. That's what you do. Whoa. So, so wow. you'd so, be, geez. they'd put a rubber band around you and then, and that's how oh. that would go. Damn. <laughs> any anesthesia so, or? I don't know. That'd be, a, I think sometimes they'd either uh, get you high on, on opium or heroin or whatever that it was wow. and have you bite a stick. But, you know, I don't, I don't remember that part, but uh, oh, shit. they used to have mouth guards where you'd, you'd have to bite on it so that you wouldn't eat your tongue. That's a whole other thing. So, uh, and for women, it was the same thing. They would just cut them up, scoop everything out, sew them back up. It was completely yes. barbaric. Yes. And uh, by, by our frame of reference, back then it was like hot in medicine uh, and revolutionary. <laughs> 